nothing but the blood of Jesus. We'll be singing that uh, later on this evening. Uh, thank you, Randy, for the great move to, today. And we welcome you. Glad that you're here for uh, the last evening of our revival. Uh, have we been blessed uh, this week by uh, the preaching of uh, Sam Hankins and by the wonderful music that we've had. And, and uh, we are so excited that uh, Sincere Revival is here uh, with us uh, today and Dan Ward uh, leading the group and uh, they will be uh, presenting their music and I know that you'll be blessed and I know that you'll be drawn closer to God through uh, their message and song. So we're excited that they'll be with us uh, here in just a few moments. Just received word that uh, one of our longtime members, uh, Jane Frazier, uh, died today. So we want to be in prayer for uh, the Frazier family. And uh, so let's uh, go to God in prayer. Oh God, we are, are thankful for the revival that uh, we have had. And uh, pray that uh, each person has been revived in spirit uh, through uh, coming and being part of our worship services. And uh, we are so very thankful for the ways that we've been able to draw closer to you during our time together. Uh, we know that uh, tonight uh, we will uh, have a close to our meetings, but we do pray that uh, each person uh, would uh, be visited by your spirit, that we would be attentive uh, to your spirit, and we'd be able to block out anything that might distract us tonight as we go forth and worship and we look forward to what you have in store for us. So thankful that Sincere Revival is here with us the way that you have gifted them and they're coming and sharing their gifts with us this evening. And may we see Christ and through what they present. And we again thank you for uh, your servant Stan who has come uh, to be with us because of his love for you. And he has uh, challenged us in many ways. And we pray that uh, tonight your spirit would flow through him as uh, he brings uh, the message to us this evening. And now as we lift our voices in song, we are grateful that we can sing praise to you, for truly you are the only one that is worthy of our praise. And so we look forward to singing those praises this evening. And we offer this prayer in the wonderful matchless name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Our theme song has been revive us again. Let us stand and sing.
visitors. We've got a number of visitors over here on this side. Welcome, and we're glad that you're a part of our worship service tonight and others that are here as well. We are so grateful again. At this time, I've mentioned every, every service uh, that uh, Reverend Stan Hankins, who comes to us from Honolulu and uh, is a part of the Ambassadors for Christ International, comes because he loves God, because he loves to proclaim the Word. And uh, we have nothing budgeted for him coming. We just, uh, out of love, give back to him. But if you would like to, to know more about his ministry, he has to raise all of his support. And uh, if you would like to learn more about his ministry, I invite you to come and speak to him after the service this evening. There's still material out there, and, and uh, he would love for you to become involved with what he does as he goes forth uh, throughout the world. So uh, I'm going to ask at this time if our ushers would come forward for our offering time. Jack, come on. Vince, come on. Next time I hold a revival, I'll have our ushers in place, I promise. But uh, let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Praise God, uh, again, we're thankful for your servant and uh, we're thankful for his ministry that uh, he uh, has been anointed to do. And we are grateful for all the ways that he proclaims Christ here on the mainland and in Hawaii and also around the world. So we pray that you would uh, just continue to uplift him, give him the strength to, to go forth, and uh, may you cover him by your spirit. We're thankful for these gifts of your people and know that they're going to be used for your service. And we offer this prayer in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen.
Andy Davis, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Uh, wonderful. We appreciate your, your gifts and the, the way that you grace us so well. So we are so very thankful for the music that you presented for us. Let us uh, stand and uh, let us sing nothing but the blood and we'll follow that with my redeemer.
No stand since uh, September of 1973, so we have uh, been uh, friends for a very long time, and I'm just so very thankful that uh, Stan could come and uh, spend some time with us. I think we all will say that we have been blessed. And uh, let me mention that Stan will be here after the benediction if you would like to greet him or if you have something that you would like to say to him or to ask you, him to pray with you about, then he will be most happy to do that. But Stan, we are again been honored for your presence with us. Please come and give to us what God has laid upon your heart. Good evening, folks. It's a pleasure and privilege to be with you our final time this evening together. And my goodness, there's such a flood of thoughts that are going through my mind. It's kind of hard to concentrate on, on uh, what the Lord might have me to say, but I can't help but share with you some of it that's rattling around in there. The first is, when, these, when Sincere Revival started to sing, the first two songs in particular I knew. And I fancied myself pretty good. And so I to come up here and grab a microphone and find it, but I couldn't find a fifth harmony card. So I was tempted to grab that fellow and say, get out of the way and I'll sing lead, but I knew he's tougher than me. So, But I'm praising God for the heartbeat y'all gave us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are we honored to have those folks with us? Yes. Yes. This entire week has been just amazing. And secondly, I work with folks all over the world, all kinds of cultures, all types of musics. Before I came here, I was taking some time just to relax a little bit late in the afternoon. I had Hawaiian music on because I'm going home to Honolulu to the island girl with flowers in her hair tomorrow. Actually, Thursday. But anyhow, I've been on the road two or three weeks and, and it will be good. Now, the second thing is then my heart's getting kind of warm and massaged. And then Randy had me ready to do the jitterbug for, jitter for Jesus. <laughs> but I'm afraid I throw the back. And then we'd have to have him. Will you? Well, now that's right. Remember what we had to say last time about Randy? I want you to watch him real close. Watch him real close because there's more to him than meets the eye. And in fact, another thought, and then, then I'll get into the word if you'll allow me, is to share. Wow, what a what a convergence of life events, and it's amazing when you get old, you have perspective. You've been around for a while. And as your pastor uh, has said, I first uh, knew him in 1973, and we came to this church together. I remember in the old building. I didn't have ministry. We were just here worshiping with, at that time, Clifford Shell was the pastor. But uh, I shared with somebody, I said, you know, I was here 50 years, 40, basically 50 years ago. And they said, well, we'll see if you can make it back in the 50 years from now. <laughs> I don't think my preaching made much of an impact. I don't want to wait that long. But you may hear it in glory, but there'll be the master saying that's enough. I got it from here. But it, it makes me think of the history and your faithfulness in life and ministry, and I celebrate that. And then when you tell me that my old roommate, Rick Clark, uh, also, and I've known Rick was in ministry all these years. I used to go through Portsmouth now and then and see him there and so forth. And I think about what silly guys we were living on the second floor of the dorm there, just had a, a heart for learning and serving the Lord. And now we're on the other end of that thing. And I was thinking as I was sitting there, as I'm here, we drove on the way to Huntington and I went by something. I said, Randy, what's all that thing with the lights on it and so forth? And he said, that's a coal washer. We don't have many of those in the Hawaii Islands. <laughs> and in Indiana, where I grew up, there weren't any. But I get it. And you know, y'all know a lot about coal. Rick Clark, Randy Maynard, Stan Hankins, among others in this room are just old chunks of coal. But after now a half century of His grace, polishing, pressing, refining, we're not dying yet. But we're going to be some good. You also know I'm channeling a little, little John Anderson. Oh, you, know, yeah. you know your country music. But isn't it wonderful yeah. that we can rejoice in His redeeming and saving grace. Now let me pray. And, and, and before I do that, just to thank again everyone who has helped in every way, technical people. Looks like you figured it out. You're amazing. And thank you for your hard work and ushers and counters and pastors and everything. You know you are blessed to have this man. But, but 
You also know he has a role to play. He's John the Baptist. Pointing the way for the next leader that God is sending here. So do as I've done for 50 years. Get rid of him. Send him on his way. <laughs> or as he's done to me more than once all over. But there's a time. And that his time is now. And then it will not be. But Lord, this is his church. And he'll use it. And Cindy, thanks for being here. Coming over from Lexington. Uh, she is the greatest blessing in this man's life. Outside of the grace of God. So we thank God for that. Now, let's pray. Be about the word. Gracious Lord. Gracious God in these moments that we spend together. We want to remove all outside distractions and simply hear the still small voice of our Savior. You know what needs to be said. I don't. So I want to be true to the Word and allow it to do its work. Holy Spirit, you are here. Glorify Jesus above all else. In His name we pray. Amen. Beyond business as usual. Are we there yet? If not, then my relentless preaching has been insufficient. Or you and I got to put all this stuff into practice. Our sermon series by that title, Beyond Business as Usual, continues and concludes tonight as we have been considering beyond business as usual in our worship, in our walk, in our world or work might be another way to say it and tonight we have one fourth and final installment in our witness as we think about a life living a life worth living now i have reminded you that the impetus for this came straight from the word when we discover that in scripture on repeated occasions the holy spirit inspired the writers to use superlatives effusive language to say things in almost out over the top ways to get our heart, get our life. Where this, where Paul said, "I will give you that you will show you a still more excellent way." The writer to the Hebrews, "I am convinced of better things for you that accompany salvation." Last night, Paul twice in Thessalonians, "Excel still more." And he said it again. Tonight, I share with you one more final one. This one comes from the lips of Jesus. How appropriate. When he said, I've come to give you life, and that you might have life, and have it more abundantly. That's superlative. That's piling it on top, as it were. Oh, did I just use the word life? Life. Priceless commodity. Every within the breast of every person in this room and every person in the history of the planet, there beats this relentless quest of a search for life. It has taken us to the farthest reaches of outer space and to the smallest particle in the laboratory test tube. Some search desperately to find life in a smoky bar room, and others find that they are achieving it in their thinking in a stuffy boardroom. Others are convinced as they relax on a plush cruise ship. Oh, man, this is the life. And there are a few who find it in an old wooden pew. What is life? Define it in your mind. Where do you find life? And very precisely, how do you hold on to life? Some of you in this room have been placed in circumstances or medical emergencies. And you've asked that question. You give everything. How can I hold on to life? Well, science and politics in particular have offered opinions to us to answer those questions. And nowadays with the raging debate over abortion, which has been going on forever, and it certainly has reached a fever pitch right now in our country, there are many who will weigh in and debate when life begins. With the advance of medical ethics, we're now wrestling with the question, of course, when does life end? You may not spend much time in your life thinking about the first, but I guarantee you, if you get a little long in the tooth, as it were, you spend a whole lot more time thinking about the second, when does life end? There's an essential question, though, that bubbles to the surface in the meantime. We ask ourselves, well, while we're here, what is the meaning 
of life. Are we just here to put in our time on the planet, get through it, and be done? Puff, smoke, we're gone in a minute? What's, what's the meaning of life? Reminds me, years ago there was a, a commercial at home for a, a particular automobile company selling new cars at home. And it was the story, it was a beautiful mountain scene in the Himalayan mountains, and this man is, is climbing to the top of a peak, and he finds this eccentric guru there with the long flowing hair and the beard, and he's sitting cross-legged, and he's got his hands in that meditative position, and the man struggles and climbs to the top of the mountain, the glacier, and the Himalayas, and he sees him, and he says, Oh, great guru, what is the meaning of life? And the guru went, The meaning of life? Meaning that he hadn't even thought about it. Let's be careful who we ask. What is the meaning of life? And I'll ask you specifically, you surely have your own thoughts on this, what makes for a quality life? In other words, you're, you're putting in your time on this planet, your heart is beating, but what makes for a quality life? That you say, God. The scripture offers us basically two primary words in the New Testament for life. There is the word bios from which we get biology. You can figure that means you're dead. That your heart is beating. It's going do, do, do. I've got an old, i got two old weenie dogs. Well, one old weenie dog and one mid medium age weenie dog. And fugu is just about 15 years of age. Fugu means blowfish in Japanese. We hang out in Japan a lot. And uh, so fugu... Uh, Winnie Dog, he's got cataracts, so he's blind. And now his hips aren't doing the best. We keep him medicated, keep him comfortable, take care of him. But I gotta tell you, every morning when I go into the sin bin where he's been sleeping, I look down at him and I look real close and I watch his stomach, or Opu in Hawaiian. Is that thing moving? Or did we lose him over the night? I want to know if he's got biology. Bios, life. We understand that. But there's another word that is used repeatedly in the New Testament. It is the word zoe. It doesn't have to do with your physical animation, but rather is asking the question or, or wrestling with the issue of what is internal, the quality of life, the essence of life, what is spiritual and eternal. And if we can get a handle on that, we're on our way to being able to define what is the meaning of life, what produces a quality life, and we're going somewhere. Well, Jesus, who claimed to be life itself, he was very bold in saying, I am the life. He had something to say to the matter, and he offers us an authoritative word. Let's hear it now from our pastor out of Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38, please. Let's Oh, wait a minute. Maybe. Ladies, now you're not allowed to fall asleep back here. Uh, did it come up? Okay. No, nope. yeah, I could. He's good. Okay. He's professional. Mark 8, 34 through 38. And he, meaning Jesus, summoned the crowd together with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it benefit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what could a person give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. In this brief presentation, Jesus offers four essential keys to abundant life. Abundant life meaning life beyond business as usual. He will suggest, or not suggest, he will declare to us the way to find your life, the way to, I'm sorry, I had a hard time saying it, the way to find your life, the way to lead your life, the way to spend your life, and the, believe it or not, the way to end your life. Don't worry, we'll work through them one at a time. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to allow Jesus to speak for himself 
novel concept, and let him proclaim it. I will call in the Apostle Paul to explain it, and it's up to you and I to practice it, to practice what we preach. Here we go. First, let's look at verse 35. You heard it read. Jesus says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Principle number one, or four, key number one, the way to find your life is to lose it. The way, to, that's paradoxical, so stay with Jesus here. The way to find your life is to lose it. Now the Master is not requiring something from us that he himself did not do. He said, the Son of Man has come to give his life as a ransom for many. I laid down my life willingly, and then he did it atop Calvary's hill. Now his ironic words that kind of make our head scratcher to us, they perplex us. So let's bring in the Apostle Paul, if he can give us a word of clarity in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. He'll explain what Jesus meant when the way to find your life is to lose it. Keep going, ladies. You're getting there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, Galatians 2.20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I, I'm sorry. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Hear Paul's words. He speaks unequivocally, as did Jesus, about death to self. He calls it crucified with Christ. In Corinthians, Paul would say, I die daily. And he's very clear about it in Romans chapter 6 when he says, If we have been buried, died with Christ in baptism, we'll be raised to newness of life through his resurrection. Please never miss the fact that the necessary entry point of the Christian life is found nowhere else than at the foot of the cross. Until you and I humble ourselves and accept what Christ did for us there that we could not do for ourselves, they sang about His precious blood. That is the essential ingredient for you and I to pass, as John called it in 1 John, from death to into life. It is found only at the cross. In fact, Paul would say the word of the cross is the power of God unto salvation. And so I would challenge you, have you experienced the cross for yourself, not just as a mental concept, not just as a historic event, but a personal transformational reality? Is that real in your life? Or are you still trying to find your life in a bank account, at a bowling alley, in the bottom of a bottle, or in the Bible. Dying to self, or are you still calling the shots in your life? Pretty simple, isn't it? Have you died to self, or are you still calling the shots? Let me put it this way. If you have lost your, in fact, go back to 1 John, I mentioned it a minute ago. One of the ways to study 1 John is to see how often he says, by this we know, by this we know, by this we know. John says, I won't take a guesswork out of this, folks. You don't have to fumble and stumble in the darkness anymore. I won't tell you how you can know you're a child of God, how you can know you've passed from death to life, etc., etc. And one of the things he says is, this is how you know you have been brought to life. I would submit to you this, if you have lost your life, you know it. Right now. You know if you have lost your life, but Paul's not done. He says, now, never that I've died, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Christ is living inside of each one of us. And Paul says, Christ lives in me. That is a supernatural infusion, a supernatural impartation, a supernatural transition, a supernatural transformation. And when that happens, when you've come to the cross by faith, not as a, a, a matter of assent, but consent, and you've said, all right, what you did on the cross, you did for me, and I want it to apply to my life, then I submit to you that in that moment, you receive from the God, from God on high, you receive hope, 
peace, joy, and love. If you've been brought to life, you know it. You think when Lazarus came out of the tomb, he went to himself, is this a dream? I don't think so. The power of God touched him. He was brought to life. First key to abundant life beyond business as usual that we may have settled for generations in our family and our own life. No. The way to find your life is to lose it. Jesus. Secondly, he says, verse 34, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. Submit to you the second key is that the way to lead your life is to follow. The way to lead your life is to follow. Everybody pursues something. Prestige, profit, popularity, power, pleasure. Would you like those again? I bet they resonate with you. Everybody pursues something. Prestige, profit, popularity, power, pleasure. Or said more crudely, if you will allow me, status, stuff, significance, sex. What do you pursue? Jesus was crystal clear that the Christian walk is no walk in the park. He said it without mistake. You are to deny yourself and take up your cross. Those six words, five words, deny yourself, take up your cross. Those six words, those words are literally to our ear, fingers on a chalkboard. Because everything in our contemporary culture where you and I were raised and where we live, everything in our culture cries out indulge yourself. The exact opposite of what Jesus said. Indulge yourself. Don't, don't you argue with me on this, because think about it. For 20 years, McDonald's told you, and you know the song, you deserve a break today. And you thought to yourself, I do. Give me a Big Mac. <laughs> Large fry. Didn't you? There was, a, again, an automobile company. They sold a particular type of automobile and their commercial said indulge yourself in luxury and then Ricardo Montalban came and said and it has Corinthian leather <laughs> and we wanted it all so bad there is a modern website and in the last eight to ten years now we're in the internet age and in the last eight to ten years, this website got a lot of publicity, including when Christians, well-known Christians, were purveyors of that website. You may have heard of Ashley Madison. Their marketing slogan, or better yet, their slogan that captures what the essence of their service that they offer on their website is. Oh, you want to hear it? Life is short. Have an affair. And they will help you do it. Many did. Our modern culture cries out opposite. Our lone Galilean cult carpenter stands in stark contrast and says, Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. No qualifiers, no apologies. There it is. Paul did just that on the Damascus Road. And it started a lifetime and frankly an eternal journey and he writes about it, Philippians 3.10, I count all things lost. Well. Paul is a man who had achieved and accomplished. And he says, when I consider those things, I count all of that to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but mere rubbish that I may gain Christ. Everybody follows something. Show me your loyalties and your priorities, and I'll show you what you follow. The way to lead your life, the 
according to Jesus, is to follow. We have to choose what we're going to follow or who. Third principle for life beyond business as usual. Verse 36. For what does it benefit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Third principle. The way to spend your life is to bank it. I need to explain that term bank it. This is paradoxical stuff here. See, we all know the phrase, I'm banking my life. I'm banking on what the doctor said. I'm banking on uh, that I get this job. I'm, I'm putting all my hopes on. I'm investing heavily in this. And if it bellies up, this isn't going to be good. Now think about this. The way to spend your life is to bank it. In our contemporary culture, everybody that's with us and around us, we spend our life accruing. That's what the American way is. Stuff, stuff, and more stuff. Perhaps you have a room or two, or a closet or two, or a garage or two, that's got stuff in it. One of the biggest businesses in the Hawaiian Islands is those storage sheds where you buy and you pay people money to put your stuff that you never see and use. Stuff. You ever seen a bumper sticker? I think this is a great one. It says, one of the most toys wins. Mm -hmm. Captures the essence of our life today. Now this world will assess and assign worth to you based upon one of three things. What you have, what you know, or what you do. Christian faith says you have worth and value because of what you are. Radically different. In verse 36, Jesus there, talking about gaining the whole world, losing your soul, he is drawing a stark contrast of that which is of true value and lasting worth and that which is mere rubbish. Old fellow that I knew who was a Vietnam vet when I was a pastor, Motorcycle ride to Vietnam vet. He was the tough guy I wanted to be. And uh, he described that concept. He said, Oh, Stan, it's all just rust and dust. I like that phrase. It's all just rust and dust. Whatever this world values and the material things that we work so hard to accrue, the stuff, just rust and dust. The true worth and value of a man or woman in this life, the only life we've been given, the true worth of a man or a woman and value that we have here is not what you gain, but rather what you give up. And so I ask you directly, if I may, what and where are you investing? Paul could answer that question, and he did it succinctly. Man, he did not miss it. He hit the nail, bang, straight on the head. Philippians 1.21. For me to live is Christ. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Paul has a singular focus. And he will tell us, as he did in Philippians, I'm investing everything. I'm focusing only on him. I'm putting all my hopes on this Jesus thing. The Apostle Paul was totally bought out, bought in and sold out. There are no divided loyalties with him. It was E. Stanley Jones who said, whatever gets your attention gets you. Jesus put it this way, you can't serve two masters. Paul would address it again in Philippians 3, when he would say, this one thing I do, the eyes on the prize. Perhaps there are some in this room, I have some friends at home, their hobby is archery, shooting bow and arrow. And they tell me that the secret to being good at being involved in archery is to block all else out of your sight, line of sight, and all else out of your mind, and focus not only on the target, but to focus on the bullseye of the target. Everyone longs for a purpose in life. A fair endeavor is to ask ourselves, okay, if we're saying what makes for quality life, what gives meaning to life, eh, what is my purpose in life? I spoke to the youth on Saturday, and I think it was Saturday, whatever, Sunday, and I pondered using a little video clip that asks people on the street, 
what's your purpose in life? Why do you, what do you want out of life? What do you hope your life is all about? And you hear the answers, and they range from, uh, uh, I don't know, one guy said, money. Oh, money? Another guy said, I'm into art. I just want to put myself out there. Art. <laughs> and then another, another fellow, this is a classic, a, a, a young, young fellow at the end, he goes, rock and roll, man. Rock and roll. <laughs> Boy, that's deep. That's deep, folks, right there. <laughs> All right, how about this one? I have, Randy and I have compared notes, and he's performed weddings, and I have performed a number of weddings, particularly in the Hawaiian Islands. In required premarital counseling, one of the things I would do is ask this bride and groom in my office before the services, I mean weeks before, a number of questions, just get to know them, but I'd start off with, well, each one of you, please tell me, what is your purpose in life? What's your agenda? What gets you up in the morning? What lights your fire? Why, what do you want your life to be about? And you'd be shocked at how many people who were getting married who could not answer that question. And then I would listen to them patiently and they'd mumble a few things. And I would just gently suggest at the end, you know, you might want to think that over. Be able to come up with an answer. Because what if you're... Two purposes are not compatible. Worse yet, think about this. You're asking this other person to get in your boat and go with you, and you haven't got a clue where it's going. Might be something to grab hold of. That's pretty high stakes, but I'll tell you where it's not fun. I'm looking in this room tonight. Go to a care home here in Wayne County and see some of those who are our senior citizens. And they're in the latter stages of life. And every day, they're just putting in their time. And frankly, many of them are just waiting to get it over with. And they struggle because at one time they lived fruitful, meaningful lives. And if they don't have something on the inside as the outside wastes away, you can see the emptiness in their eyes, and the loneliness in their voice, the lack for a purpose. The way to spend your life is to bank it, invest everything on Christ. Jesus in verse 36, and it's our last point, he chooses in an odd way to broach the topic of the future and the kingdom of God. And so therefore we can see that the fourth principle is the way to end your life is to entrust it. Yes, he really does. Jesus talks about, and this preacher is going to talk about, if you're going to die, you might as well do it right. The way to end your life is to entrust it. The Pew Research Forum, one of the most respected in the world and in this country, suggests to us that 17%, only 17% of Americans do not believe in an afterlife. Or put it in the other term. 83% of us believe that when there is the grave, there's something else beyond that. 17% say, it's over. Okay. Of those who believe there is an afterlife, 74% believe there's a heaven. 61% say there is hell. The rest are going to wait and see. <laughs> and they will. Now, I have to wonder this. Where did you get your idea? Fair question. If you're going to... Eternity's a long time. If you're saying, this is what I, I'm doing for the next eons, where I'm going to be, well, where'd you get the idea? It comes from one of three sources. Personal desires, popular opinion, or the Word of God. Can you think of any others? If somebody says, well, yeah, let's be positive. Well, that's what I'm going to heaven. There's a heaven. They either believe in that and, and are banking on it because they hope they want there to be a heaven. Or watch well, what everybody else says, so I'm going to cry. Or they've taken the time to say, is this true? And what does it say? And they understand it from that. 
Those are one of their three choices. Paul spoke about that, not in theory, but in fact. Because in 2 Timothy chapter 4, the year 65 AD, Paul is in prison in Rome. And the end is coming. The end is coming in his life, and the end is coming to this sermon. So hang in there. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Nero has arrested him. And we know from history, and they knew in real experience, this is the real deal. He is torturing Christians and lighting up Rome. And Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4, hear these words. He is at the end of a 30 to 40 year illustrious, powerful ministry. I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Here's a man who says two primary things in that profound last times pen went to paper from his lips. He talks about past in verse 7, the future in verse 8. In verse 7, he says, I have a sense of accomplishment and a security of assurance. His sense of accomplishment, looking back, he says, I did it. It works. And it mattered. Can you say that? Are you able to look back at the past record of your life and say, I did it. It mattered. It works. Then he looks ahead. And this is a man who is facing immediate and certain execution. And he could have said it this way. By this time tomorrow, when that guillotine falls on this neck, within the next 12 hours, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, and I'll be with the Lord. That is a security of assurance. Are you secure? Are you assured? Because I have to tell you, as I come to a close, none of us are getting out of here alive. Life is terminal. I had been traveling and COVID and my doctor and all kinds of stuff. I finally had my physical after a year and a half, yearly physical. And my doctor, the first thing when I walked in the office, an assistant came and shoved some papers under my nose and said, you need to fill these out. These were end of life declarations. In other words, when and how to hold blood. That was my first clue of getting old. <laughs> It went downhill from there. Alright. Life is terminal. So we're all going to die. Jesus offers us how to do it right. He makes it clear. The way to end your life is to entrust it. Don't try to hang on to it. Don't make it cry out of your cold, clammy thing. The question of ultimate destiny and security can only be put off so long. Well, I told you. The sands are going through the hourglass. Mine are. What we have done tonight, what we have done this week, my time in Canova has come to a close. Your time in Canova will come to a close. What are you doing with it? Where are you pursuing it? Where are you entrusting it? You can solve that question tonight. Pray with me, please. Great and gracious God, you are the author of life. Thank you for the gift. Now, we have so many questions about life, and we confess that the, the relentless search is something we don't have to manufacture. It's just there. What amazing truth that we have been given the key to life and life abundantly. And indeed, that is far better than business as usual. Just putting in our time and dying a little bit each day. Lord, we know that our outer man is decaying, the bios. 
But the Zoe, the inner man, is being renewed day by day. May that take an exponential leap in our hearts and lives right now, lasting throughout eternity. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to a close, I am not one for giving prolonged uh, manipulative invitation. If the Holy Spirit is speaking, I said it earlier, didn't I? If you have lost your life, you know it. If you have found your life, you know it. If the Holy Spirit has touched your heart, you know it. So if He's speaking to you about coming to Him for the first time, no one comes to the Father except to me, except the Father drawing him. That has happened. And you say, I need to meet Christ for the first time. This is an opportunity to do that. If you are walking with the Lord, but over the course of this week, He said, you don't have to just put in your time anymore. You don't have to do just enough to get by. By my grace, I can do all of you. You never eat beyond, abundantly beyond what you ask or even able to think. Then you feel free to come on out to do business with God. If you want to pray with me, great. If you and God want to work it out, even better. This is your opportunity. Let's sing our closing song. Let's stand and sing Jesus to Asia.